Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from the triune God. Amen. The common theme in our morning readings involves God's anointing and choosing. Samuel the prophet anoints young David in the place of Saul as Israel's king. Psalm 23, which we sang, David tells God, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Paul writes to the Ephesians about the Lord choosing us to be light and to be living as children of light. And in today's gospel reading, our Lord chooses this blind man to anoint him with mud and speak to him his healing. The gospel story begins with a kind of once upon a time. It says, as Jesus was walking along. So once upon a time, Jesus was walking along and he saw a man who was born blind. Immediately, the subject matter devolves theological, particularly around the doctrine of sin. Jesus' disciples want to know cause and effect. Who sinned? This man? That he was born blind? Or who's to blame? What about his parents? You see, blind people and the lame are ritually impure and excluded from priesthood and even from entry into the temple. Second-class citizens, at best, they are physically deficient. And so something must have gone wrong. Somebody must have done something terrible for this son of Israel to have been born blind and despised and marginalized. The man born blind is that marginalized other. Later on, the Pharisees charged Jesus that he broke the Sabbath and they attempt to undermine or invalidate his miracle because the Pharisees are threatened. As long as the man remains blind, he can be excluded from their club. But when Jesus heals the outcast and he makes him an equal, authenticating both himself and the formerly blind as genuine children of God. They have to figure out a way now to invalidate Jesus, the man, the healing, so that they continue, can continue to exclude. Anyway, back to the disciples. When they first ask about the subject of sin, Jesus takes it entirely off the table. Not about sin at all, Jesus says, but the blindness happens so that God's works might be revealed in him. And what works are they? They are works of pure grace. Jesus, who is grace, acts just like grace. Without invitation or permission or provocation, Jesus just inserts himself, violates personal space, mixes up some clay, smears the man's eyes, and heals him. Especially, he heals him by the word that he spoke, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. We Lutherans deeply value God's word and its power. We believe in the Reformation principle of word alone, which has a special meaning to us. When we say God's word, we don't mean the Bible exactly, but rather the message that the Bible contains. That message is the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. The gospel message is what's inspired, not every little black and white letter that's on the printed page. Luther says that the Bible is a container. He calls it the manger or the swaddling clothes that holds the precious Christ. Christ our salvation is the inspired, infallible, inerrant, living word of God. As Lutherans, we also believe that the word is affixed to the sacraments. Water baptism, Holy Communion, save us because God's word says that it's so. Attached to the elements of water, bread, and wine, and in their use, God says 
we're saved through Christ. The water and the bread and the wine are the physical part. God's word is the say-so part. We're saved because God says so. Otherwise, without the word, the say-so, water is plain water and bread is just plain bread and wine is just plain wine. In the case of the man born blind, Jesus employs a personal kind of sacrament, doesn't he? He takes physical elements, saliva, mud, or, or dirt, mixes it into a mud, smears it on the man's eyes, and then he speaks his word. He says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. When the Pharisees keep on asking the man, how are your eyes opened? The man answers, this man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, said to me, go wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. When they turn the matter into a theological debate, his only recourse is to share his personal testimony and experience. He throws up his hands and says, I don't know. I don't know how Jesus did it. All I know is that I was once blind, but now I see. Jesus said so, and the man did what Jesus said so. That's all he knew to tell them. Jesus literally fulfilled the scripture that says he sent forth his word and he healed them. The power of God's word, I think, manifest through choosing and anointing is the most important takeaway lesson from this morning's reading and not all that theological debate that follows through most of the chapter. I recently listened to an illustration preached by a pastor named Alistair Begg. And I'm going to read it for you. He speaks in a uh, strong Irish accent. And if I slip into it, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll try not to. He said, without the preaching of the cross, without the preaching of the cross, to ourselves all day, every day, we are very quickly to revert to faith plus works as the ground of our salvation. To go to the old question, if you were to say tonight, if you were to die tonight and gain entry into heaven, what would you say? If you answer or if I answer anything other than in the third person, we've gone wrong immediately. Because I believed, because I had faith, because I am this, because I am continuing. And then he says, beloved, the only proper answer is in the third person. Because he, because Jesus did it, because Jesus said it. Then he says, think about the thief on the cross. I, I can't wait to find out that fellow one day and ask, how did that all shake out for you? Because you were cussing out Jesus with your friend. You'd never been to a Bible study. You never got baptized. You didn't know a thing about church membership. And yet you made it. How did you make it? He says, that's what the angel must have said. What are you doing here, said the angel. I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Because I don't know. And the angel says, excuse me, I have to go get my supervisor. And... He goes and gets his angel supervisor and he says, we, we just have a few questions for you. First of all, are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? The guy says, I never heard of it in my life. And, and what about, let's just go to the doctrine of scripture immediately. This guy is just staring. And eventually in frustration, the angel asks, on what basis did you get here? And the man says, the man, the man on the middle cross said I could come. The man on the middle cross said I could come. That's exactly the reason why we're here this morning in the presence of the Holy Spirit affirming it 
worship and celebrating our salvation. It's the only reason we can say God's work our hands because the, middle, the man on the middle cross said I could come. We're saved because God says so. We were blind and now we see because God says so. To the Ephesians, Paul writes, you are the light of the Lord. Now go out and live like children of light. To use John's metaphor, we're all born blind. Why? Was it our sin or somebody else's? Jesus doesn't, says it doesn't even matter. By word and sacrament, he gives us occasion and ability to see again for the first time. He says, now you're clean by the word that I've spoken to you. He says, because I say so. Spiritual eyesight may not come to us immediately all at once but in maybe in stages, we may be like the person who begins to see only partially and Jesus asks, what do you see? And he says, I see men like trees walking. And then the man says later on, I can see all people clearly. We're anointed with divine eye salve of the Holy Spirit. The eyes of our hearts are enlightened. We're enabled to see light and be light, graced with new vision toward new possibilities, promises, opportunities, and a bright tomorrow. Oh, the places you'll go. Oh, the amazing places you'll go and the things that you'll do. And with all that, with all that promise, I guarantee you, you are saved more than you can possibly know. When Samuel anointed David with oil, it changed his entire trajectory and destiny. When Jesus anointed the blind man with clay, sent him with his word, it changed that man's entire trajectory and destiny. The Holy Spirit changes everything. The Holy Spirit's anointing changes everything. Here's a modern day example of anointing in several weeks. Prince Charles will be crowned King of England. The coronation ceremony is rife with tradition and biblically symbolic meaning. It takes place in Westminster Abbey. It's a church service of the Church of England. The Holy Spirit is invoked. And at a given moment, anthem music begins to play, composed by George Friedrich Handel for the coronation of King George in 1727. Prince Charles will be led to King Edward's chair, which may or may not have the stone of scone underneath it, nestled in. By tradition, that stone is Jacob's pillow, that he had his vision of Jacob's ladder going up into heaven, and where God reconfirmed to him the universal blessing that he made to Abraham. When Charles is seated, the Archbishop of Canterbury will anoint the king's hands and breast and head with oil, holy oil that is made of ambergris, orange flowers, roses, jasmine, cinnamon. You can smell it, can't you? <laughs> and all through the procession toward that anointing, the people will be singing these words. Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon king. And all the people rejoiced and said, God save the king. Long live the king. God save the king. May the king live forever. Amen. And I dare to say during Lent, Alleluia. By consent of the people and by spiritual anointing, Charles will hold the reins of the trajectory and destiny of the British monarchy and the Church of England. That anointing leads to spiritual eyesight and new vision that leads to new destiny. And those are the words I want you to hear for yourselves as well, because we too are a people of new expansive trajectory and destiny. How do I know that? Because I read the vision and mission statement of the ELCA. Goal. Share the story of Jesus and the ELCA by engaging a million new people as we grow the church together. Purpose, activate each of us 
So more people know the way of Jesus and discover community. Vision, a world experiencing the difference God's grace and love in Christ make for all people and creation. It's a big vision of invitation, welcome, inclusion, <laughs> connection, to lead us boldly and confidently into this new century. And Agnes Day, I can tell you, is up to the challenge. Uniquely chosen for this time and place, anointed with the Holy Spirit, having healed eyes to see new possibilities and new destinies, and especially because the man in the middle makes his claim. Faithful is he who called you, who also will do it. Amen.